see them we're not sure how to do this without George so hello Zoomites <laughs> we're glad you're here okay okay so very quickly I want to recap uh, what we're talking about before we plunge into a, a more open discussion so um, <laughs> no it's not working so, so say what? Well, people always get yeah, it on stuff and they dress to like so anyway. Now that we're trying to dress like we called each other this morning. Uh, <laughs> I have my name tag on. Okay. I have the man once today already. <laughs> What, uh, what we're talking about are these 500 year cycles that appear in, in the history of the church and in the in culture and society at large. The first one, go ahead, was um, uh, the, the, the Great Transformation. The second, the uh, Council of uh, Chalcedon, uh, about 500 years later, then the Great Schism, about a thousand years later, then the Great Reformation. And now, 500 years later, we're at what is being called the Great Emergence because something is emerging and we're not sure what it is. Um, did you do that? <laughs> okay. So, starting in about the, the middle of the 60s, um, Diana Butler Bass calls it the, the Fourth Great Awakening, where the Holy Spirit spread across denominations and, and um, uh, people from all different kinds of denominations, Catholic, Episcopalian, Methodist, you name it, were moving in the, in the spirit, um, speaking in tongues with a new kind of worship, and that sort of died out into the 80s, and then the emerging church in the 80s through about 2010, the missional church, also uh, called the authentic church or the organic church, Many home, uh, home church movements started in there as well. And now we're into what um, Gabe Lyons, who was the director of uh, the Barna Research Group, who's done a ton of surveys, um, wrote this one called The Next Christians, simply because we don't have a name for it yet. We're in the throes of this movement. We don't have a name, but, but whatever's coming next is what we're calling it. And Brian McLaren calls it simply the church on the other side, the other side of transition. And then last week we talked about this, about how in by about 1960, all churches in North America fell into one of these four quadrants. They were liturgical, so uh, high Lutheran, 
Catholic, Episcopalian, Anglican, and then social justice were uh, Methodists and Presbyterians, uh, renewalists were Charismatics and Pentecostal, and in the conservative corner, we had uh, Baptists, Bible-believing Baptists, maybe Missouri Synod Lutherans, you know, that, I don't know when they broke off. I don't know, but anyway. 1970. 1970, okay. So. So you don't, you don't include LDS and uh, I would put them in the conservative corner. Some, some would argue they're not a Christian church. Um, we had a, a, a great pastor when we were in an evangelical church in Utah, and he described how the, the, um, the Mormon, you've got Protestant Christianity, and then you've got the LDS faith, the Mormons, and they've made so many accommodations to traditional evangelicalism that they're either going to fall and collapse into evangelicalism, or they're going to uh, do kind of like a counter-reformation and, and go way back to the things that they, that distinguished them initially, because they've gone so far toward conservative evangelicalism. Well, that's mostly in their um, in their social statements. Yeah, yeah. Not in their not really in their theology. No, not in their theology, but in the, many of the. You're right, and many of the social statements they make. Yeah. So, can I ask a question? Yes. So what do you make about you have method? You have Methodists in social justice, yeah. and as of right now, they're splitting because of the mm -hmm. LGBT. Mm -hmm. So, they'll probably just be. I think some Methodists may may shift down shift down to conservative, and the other ones will stay in the social justice area. Yeah. Good question. Uh, Tickle says that she thinks by the middle of the century, she actually said 2025, because she wrote this book in 2005, 2006. 2025 is three years away. I don't see it happening that fast, but maybe by the middle of the century, most Christians in North America will be swirling in the center. They will be taking aspects of, of uh, tradition and faith and dogma and doctrine from other branches, and that um, some will retreat to the corners and maintain their, their traditional form. Others will renew in the center in something new and nobody really knows what that is. So last week we asked these questions. What do you think the future church will look like in 30 years? So from now to say 2050, what might unloading the doctrinal core look like for the ELCA? Remember the doctrinal core are those things that are, that are um, very basic. And too often what, what has happened in the last 150 years is we've dumped into the doctrinal core a lot of interpretation differences and a lot of opinions. And so now we're, we're looking at churches that are, are trying to empty that doctrinal core, not empty it, but unload the doctrinal core so there aren't so many interpretations and opinions there. And so what might unloading the doctrinal core look like for the ELCA? And what might unloading the doctrinal core look like for you? So, who wants to share right here in front of the pastor? <laughs> I got my notebook. <laughs> it starts out with three doctrinal cores. Let's, um, let's turn the mic over there. Oh, I can say it starts with three ELCA doctrinal cores so we can work with it. It's so nice. <laughs> So we're going to start with what is the, the doctrinal core for the ELCA? Speaking with all the authority the ELCA is asking me to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some things I can think of as examples of the doctrinal core of the ELCA might be um, saved by grace through faith, right? Um, and let's see, how about. Um, Something that might be an example of a bloated doctrine before you heard the, uh, you might be a Lutheran if jokes. You might be a Lutheran if you make your uh, hot dish with cream of mushroom soup and your salad and jello. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's going to become more of what it means to be Lutheran for a lot of folks, but being out here on the West Coast, that doesn't apply to us so much. So maybe that's a doctrine before that can be unloaded. Um, 
you know, one of the one of the fuzzy areas might be what is Lutheran hymnody. Yes. Right. That, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Right. What right. is what are what are the songs that we sing that are distinctly Lutheran? You know, those sorts of things. So those might be some examples of different parts of doctrinal core. Well, that seems to be. <laughs> That seems to be cultural and not doctrinal. I mean, I I I want to maybe discuss this uh, discuss a little bit more what doctrinal core means because that seems to be what are the belief systems that are are uh, deal breakers. I mean, there you know what what is essential. What makes the ELCA different than the whatever, whatever? And what are the belief systems? Because I think hymnody, for example, which expresses, I suppose, doctrinal, so you can make that connection that way, but that's very cultural. Yes. The fact that we sing, you know, 16th century European white American, right. white, white European composer, whatever hymns, that's just part of the culture from which we come. But that is not necessarily, in my opinion, uh, part of the of the key core doctrine of the Lutheran Church. Um, uh, I already have a mic right here, so <laughs> let me just pass that around. Um, I'll give you a suggestion. Um, how many sacraments does the Catholic Church have? Seven. Seven. The church that we went to had nine, I think, sacraments. How many does, does the ELCA have? Two. two. So you've put a lot of pressure on just those two things to carry all of the, the sacraments of the church. And as somebody who came not from a, from a uh, uh, Mike, background, I can speak a lot of that. Yeah, but this is from, from but the, the people yeah. on uh, Zoom. Uh, it seems to me that baptismal, baptism is really core much more to the Lutheran church than well, maybe to the Episcopal Church and Catholics too, but certainly more than the Methodists. Yeah. See, I think in some ways the ELCA has already done a lot of unloading of the doctrinal court. For instance, um, uh, we had a guy, uh, a, a grumpy Mormon, that was just the name of his block, the grumpy Mormon, and he attended our Theology on Tap in Logan, Utah. And he got permission from his bishop, he had to get permission to do this, to go visit a bunch of other churches to observe and to participate in how they did the Eucharist, the communion, the Lord's Supper, whatever, whatever words you want to use. And he brought that back in a write-up and he shared it with us at Theology on Tap. And it was fascinating because we tend to think, well, everybody does the Lord's Supper like we do. Oh, no. The Lutherans do, or uh, the LDS does it with bread and water, and you have to be over the age of eight to participate. Baptists do it with grape juice and bread, and you have to be over 13 to do it. And they only do it once a month because it's serious business. And it would decrease its sanctity if you did it multiple times. Um, Catholics do it with bread and wine, and not bread and wine, but like a wafer and wine, but only the priest gets the wine. Everybody else just gets the way. And, and so every church does that different. You give the Eucharist to little kids who don't have a clue except it's free food. And, and who may not have been baptized. Right. Which in some ELC churches, that's for both. Right. And I was raised Baptist where you had to be over the age of 13, the age of accountability, and they only did it once a month, and it was um, uh, whole... Uh, That'll show up now? It was Wonder Bread and Grape Juice. Wonder Bread. Little <laughs> cut up pieces of Wonder Bread. What, what the Lutheran Church has already changed, but they used to do once a month, and you had to be confirmed. Right. And uh, now we do it more frequently, yeah. yes. I remember in the military synod, and mm -hmm. you had to go to the pastor's office and register to go to the communion on Sunday. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can get sent to you on a change that was up. So, Bill, Bill, 
when we're talking about all these differences, we still all have that core um, doctrine of of communion yes. as you know as something that I don't think we want to unload. So I'm looking at more things that um, that we might want to unload. So uh, that's that's what. Let me ask you this. Do do Lutherans have to have a building? No. Can Lutheran uh, worship liturgy occur in a home with just a dozen people? Not the Eucharist. Not the Eucharist. Why? Well, uh, I'm so yeah. When I was a volunteer at the Open Bed Breakfast, we were down Lake, and um, we were not allowed, even if there was a uh, retired pastor on staff, we were not allowed to have our own communion service because the idea is it's part of a community right. and we were just a small group a part extended from another community. And that never really surprised me about the DLC. Yeah. And um, in, the, in the tradition, I was in the Pentecostal tradition um, I and that as a licensed minister, even before I was a licensed minister, I administered the sacrament. We rotated, and lots of different people did it. And you didn't have to be ordained, you didn't have to be licensed, you didn't even have to hardly be. Well, you had to be, you had to be an adult, and it could be male or female. But could administer the sacrament. We were distributing it. Pastors still prayed over it. Oh, not always, not always. <laughs> <laughs> the only witness. <laughs> we have different members. That's all changed with COVID because right. we gave communion to each other in the privacy of our own home right. alone. Yep. So we did too, but there were many churches, even in the Lutheran tradition, where um, on Zoom the pastor did it and the people were not allowed to. We're not allowed to. So, is that something that has to remain in the doctrinal core? Is the question. I remember when we went to a woman's retreat and we had communion, um, and we didn't have a pastor there, but we had uh, the communion pre blessed, so to speak, so that it would be distributed. Now, I don't know, that was an end run around this, I guess, right. but uh, that's something for me that could be totally unloaded okay. because it just seems silly. So, well, I know we don't want this whole conversation just to uh, land on uh, communion, but I went to a retreat, retreat once where the speaker was Susan Brill, and um, she was advocating for the small children to do it, and she said to think of it kind of in reverse, rather than am I worthy to receive communion, do I have permission from the pastor, and I have to think of it as eating your way to the cross. Mm -hmm. that, that the food and the drink is welcoming and will bring someone in to then observancy. And that really, that really changed my whole views. Um, and it's, it's stuck with me. I thought it was really nice. And my grandmother, by the way, her only had communion once a year. Wow. Um, because you had to be so sure that you were worthy of it. Wow. We have unloaded, and I would say we've unloaded a lot of celebration of our Scandinavian German heritage mm -hmm. that used to be tied really close to being a Lutheran. Um, Although we're still a very white, church. we're still very white, and that's something we need to address. Um, we have started the process of um, unloading um, phobia. Dislike whatever it is of the LGBTQ community mm -hmm. started with our 2009. So we, we've been doing it. We're still talking about right. more. Right. Very good. Uh, well, to get back to your original question um, about unloading that girl form, uh, I, it was mentioned last Wednesday at a text study that, uh, and we do this in text study a lot, that we look at the meaning of the Bible in terms of metaphysical and symbolic terms, yeah, and, and uh, you know, I grew up 
and the three zip, and everything in the three zip world. And I don't know that had to, is linked with having to be safe. But when you look, and I don't know if I'm ready to give this up because when you look at the creeds, it says it. <laughs> You believe that people die, or you know, and so uh, that's part of the baptism. That's part of the Eucharist. The whole thing is, yeah, I like to get away from the literal, but I'm not ready to throw out the, the confession. Right. Okay. Yeah. So and I don't know what to different do with churches that. have different hermeneutical frameworks. That is, different interpretive frameworks. And I think the ELCA's is probably. Um, metaphysical or met metaphorical and symbolic, whereas the Missouri Synod, their hermeneutic is literal. And that, that affects how you believe things. And yet the creed is very literal. We were just talking about the creed yeah. after, after church this morning, that what would, what would a, a reformulated creed look like if instead of saying, I believe in the uh, Father God Almighty Creator, we said, I believe in a God whose self-giving love is sacrificial. And we just step back from creation in almightiness and say, God is love. And I believe in that God. And then Jesus Christ, not as the lion of the tribe of Judah, but as the lamb slain, who gave himself freely as a sacrifice for to, to demonstrate solidarity with the human race. I mean, it's a, it's, so it's a whole different approach on the creed. We have to remember the creeds were the product of a culture under a Roman empire and it's framed that way. And what would a creed look like today if it was framed a different way? I mean, how would, how would, uh, Moltmann or Brueggemann write the creed today as opposed to how it was done 2,000 years ago. It's all about writing the theories of evolution into the creed. Well, so that's why sometimes I feel like I have to cross my fingers when I say the creed. But in terms of literal belief in the creed, you know, I, I'm going, I either don't say it or I cross my fingers. And, <laughs> and you know what, what I have done personally is I, I went on, I started this exercise in about 2015 to rewrite the creed for me. And, 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 and I did it in kind of like three columns on a big sheet. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty Creator, Heaven, Earth. Well, what does that mean? And what does that mean to me? And then I rewrote it. And I'm still in that process of working through all those things. But anyway. I wonder about belief in general. How, how core is belief as we understand it? Uh, Ronnie mentioned writing the theory of evolution into the, into the creed. Is that what the creed is for? Is, is the creed itself something we need to believe is literally true? Right. Or it doesn't have a different purpose. What is the purpose of the creed, right? Carol? Well, I think that's a big distinction between belief and faith. Because belief is a belief in a theory. Right. And uh, I think some of the things we talked about here are not really necessarily doctrine, but just practice. Right. Itself. And how do you live, right? Not orthodoxy, but orthopraxy. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think we need to redefine some of those words to know what they actually mean. Yeah. Because Borg, Marcus Borg says, belief, it means beloved. And another way of looking at, you know, how you keep God in there is beloved. It's not, you have to check those good things that you have to ascribe to. It's how you are in your relationship to God. Well, and we're confronted in life with all these existential questions. Uh, can we take our own life? You know, at the end, if there's nothing left, 
if you have a child who exists outside of what some conservative people say is not uh, able to live, you know, to be ordained as a pastor. I, mean, I like that about faith and I hate it. It is a constant path of a struggle. And I think within ourselves, as we come here, we worship and renew our faith, we struggle with those all the time. Yeah. And I think that does change how we think about the doctrine, of course. Yeah. Let me let me move on because uh, when we, we talked about this at, at theology on tap, and I made everybody come with with two or three things. So everybody came and we wrote them down. Let me show you what some of those things are. Okay. One person said, we're going to see a shift from institutions organized for self-preservation to what's best for the common good, more outward focused. Do you want to claim it? Yeah, because this is Gary's. Gary's <laughs> 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 I, I'm going in, I, I take this from um, the perspective of the Lutheran Church and how it's organized. Um, but uh, again, what churches are going to remain because there's going to be a big block sale of churches. Yeah. And uh, the way the church is structured, uh, the money is going to go back to the synod um, in most cases. And then they can request it on the church wide if they want or create new ministries. So I think, again, the progressive churches that are left are going to be um, basically centers of community service. And uh, the books I've read. Um, they're basically going to um, have people that belong. That's kind of the next thing. Right. That uh, kind of um, believe in what that community center is doing. And um, that's going to be the ministry. And right. There will probably be worship there because the sanctuary still exists. It could be uh, some of these churches are progressive. They could have. Uh, apartment complexes is part mm -hmm. of the whole center. I know churches yeah. in eastern Washington that way that they have retirement centers as part of their church. But um, it, it's really going to be, from my perspective, the community um, centers serving the community. Yeah. This distinction between these three sets of fees is really important because uh, Protestantism for a long time, probably since Martin Luther, have said, if you believe like us and you behave like us, you can belong with us. So people who didn't behave right looked at the inside of the church and said, I don't belong there. And they just never came and went away. Flipping that on its head, if a church says, you're human, you're loved by God, you belong with all the other humans who are loved by God. And if you hang around with us long enough, you'll start to behave like us. And then you'll understand why we do what we do and you'll believe like us. You see the difference between the two? One is pushing out, the other saying, come on in, come on in. Um, we talked a lot about the fact that the future of the church would be more um, spiritual and open to the mystical and the contemplative. We, we found this quote from Carl Rahner, Carl Rainer, Rahner, Rahner, Rahner. The Christian of the future will be a mystic or will not exist at all. And even though we'll be pursuing the mystical and contemplative, we'll still need community more than ever. How will that community take place? Well, that's the question, isn't it? So looking at a decentralized church, perhaps more driven by technology, because culture will be driven by technology. And then somebody else said, no, no, there's gonna be a backlash against all the social media and against that technology. And we're gonna move back to reality-based community, which is interesting. How would you get your reality-based community together except to call them up with your technology or email them, <laughs> right? And say, hey, we're gonna meet face-to-face -face on Saturday. So, the technology is just woven into what we're going to be and do, I think. So I think this top one was, was David, right? Yeah. Uh, decentralized church, perhaps more driven by technology. Um, I think, Mary, this was you. Another reformation driven less by dogma and beliefs 
and more by actions and love. And there's a great quote in um, Brian McLaren's book, which I, I hope we'll get to at the end about, uh, about this notion of, of action. Did you know that the early church was famous as a social care unit because they would rescue orphans and babies that had been left out to die. And the, the earliest hospitals where people were cared for and, and allowed to die in, in care were set up by monks and nuns in the church. So this radical shrinking of the welfare state, Carol, I think this was you, um, and the church filling that gap in social services by becoming a critical provider of social services that the state won't supply. So maybe we go back to that early Christian root of we're the welfare, we provide. You know what's going to be necessary for that is y'all have to tithe more. <laughs> the only problem I have with that is if the church says we will not provide some certain services right. because it's against our theology. Right. So then it becomes a controlling uh, factor. We'll feed you if you believe like us. Yeah, yeah. We won't yeah abortions. Jesus, Jesus never had a litmus test. You know, when he fed the 5,000, like all you who want fish and bread, and if you believe in me, and if you don't cheat on your wife, and if you find the temple, come on and eat. He didn't do that. The converse of that, I've thought about a lot. As we have, as, as our governmental systems have taken on more of those roles, and culturally that becomes more acceptable, if, if, for example, it went the other way, which I don't know or not, but if the state or other nonprofit organizations took that on and the church didn't need to do that anymore, what does the church do then? What role does that fill there? You know, like if the if the if one of the quote unquote end goals of Christian faith is to engender love for our neighbors and that becomes a cultural thing. Then what's the church's next yeah. end goal, right? Right, right. Uh, and now it, it, it's interesting. Have any of you like? Well, David, you've been to Germany, right? Yeah. We had a friend from Germany who, who came back to the states. She was an American, but she came back to the states after living in Germany for thirty years, and she could not get her head around the fact that the churches were always asking for money because in Germany. The church is funded by the state. They pay the salary of the choir directors. Yeah, and you don't have to. You know, you, you don't have to give. So you these are tax. <laughs> yeah, you tax, right? Yeah. right. But that makes a big difference. And also, if you want to you have your baby baptized, okay. Oh sure, yeah. Would you baptize a baby that hadn't paid? <laughs> Yeah, you <laughs> radical. <laughs> I just want to just to draw that apart. I, that makes a big difference in how churches reach out. But I am organ. But I have observed from my relatives in Germany that the pastors and they don't they don't do the re evangelical mm -hmm. reaching out to people. Uh, it's not the penny they're going to get their right. salaries no matter what. Right. And the openness and, and trying to get some more members in, I, I think it's less so. Maybe it's changing now, but it's the people that are working hard to really recruit them, yeah. even though the attendance is so low. Right. And, but, and there are churches in Germany that don't take the federal money and they rely on the tithes and offerings of so the it's church members. So there. I think yeah. it's um, I don't remember who said this, but that there would probably be no physical churches anymore in the future, but that we would have home churches, no uh, official corporate worship services per se, no ordained leaders. And with that, you have the dangers of a personality based groups without the guardrails of structure and denominations. And Lyle Miller was with us said he, he believed that we would see a, decent, uh, a decentralized church 
but that we would still have a structure and organizational guardrails will remain in place to stop people from um, becoming personality cults and stuff like that. Um, uh, David, I think this was you, a decentralized church, less hierarchy, less formal, less structure, and less organization in the future. Uh, that there would be a backlash to authoritarian church structure and that there would be a backlash to the way authoritarian, authoritarian churches infringe on personal boundaries. And that there would be a backlash to patriarchal church structure and a backlash to church political involvement. And because, I mean, we really saw this from about 1972, 73 on with the creation of the moral majority and, and churches getting involved in politics and all of that. So that there'd be a backlash against that. The church is going to focus on the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of man. But the Supreme Court's going to change some of that. There we are. In what? In what? In well, what? for example, the 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 church and state, uh, the separation of church and state, which has existed for as long as the country has existed, is under much more threat now, I believe, with the courts because they are entering. Like the Riverton case, for example. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that comes out. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to go back just a second to the mystical idea. Um, the which which idea? The mystical idea comes uh -huh. like that. Um, I was just going to say that I think one of the interesting things in the Northwest is the Conflict service at St. Mark's on Sunday. Yes. Mark's. Because here you have I mean, this is it's it's counter. Uh, countercultural, actually, in that you have, and it's mostly a young crowd, mm -hmm. and the and the music and the service is as liturgical as it gets. Yep. Do you, do you all know what she's talking about? No. Okay. I to every okay. Yeah. So Saint Mark's Episcopal Church in Seattle right. holds a Compline service every Sunday night. They open the doors wide, and Anybody and everybody who wants to can come in, and, and people pillows, they bring and pillows and quilts and blankets and and yeah. sleeping bags. Some of them are on the altar, some are on the steps, some are laying in the aisles. Exactly. And uh, we went, and I kept waiting for the choir to show up, and then they started singing. They were way, way back in the far corner. They were not front and center way back in the corner. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced. But it's just so interesting because to, to me, you know, you talk about praise bands, etc. And here you have young people coming by the droves into yeah. this very liturgical, very musical, yeah. very old musical yeah. uh, setting. And it, it kind of mixes up things in some interesting ways because you have you know, you're not sitting there properly and kneeling for the praise, blah, blah, blah. Right. You are like as comfortable as you can possibly get, and maybe more. Um, and, but still at all, that, that has to, that draws people in very interesting ways. Yeah, it does. It's also a fun one by an organ concert. Usually about that's right. People stay for that. Yeah. So that yeah. That's yeah. right. That was one of the highlights for me, too. Say it sounds to me like they've made that flip from belief, behave, belong to belong, behave, believe. Right. Everyone belongs. You're welcome. Right. Come, however right. you are, however you want. Right. And as they hear this, then they may absorb some ways of behaving and believing. Um, and I do think that's part of the future. <laughs> okay. I want to now shift gears and talk about something else. How many of you have heard the term deconstruction? That, that Christians are going through a deconstructive process. It's a, it's a big no-no in the evangelical world to go through deconstruction. Um, it's been, people. I mean, if you've been following it even just the last six months, it's been crazy. The number of people coming out against deconstruction, like it's some sort of terrible heretical 
idolatry thing that people are doing, but it, it relates to the stages of faith, which we all, we all know we go through uh, human stages of human development, right? You're an infant, you're a crawler, you're a toddler, you know, a young child, then you go through puberty and you're a monster. All stages of development. <laughs> Um, your faith has gone through the same kinds of stages. This book by James Fowler, The Psychology of Human Development and the Quest for Meaning, Stages of Faith, is very academic, but really, really interesting. And two other authors, one a psychologist and one a pastor, took the stages of faith identified in Fowler, and they call it the critical journey, um, Janet Hagberg and Robert Welch. And this is far more accessible than Fowler. So if you're only going to buy one book, buy Hagbert and Welch. Um, and then Kathy Escobar uh, wrote this book in 2014, and she takes two stages out of Hagbert and Welch and amplifies it and explains it. Now, the interesting thing with this book is that we didn't know and we were going through deconstruction. We knew we were frustrated. We knew we were angry. We knew the church just wasn't doing it for us anymore. And then I read this book, Faith Shift, and it, in, in many ways, it kind of freaked me out because what Kathy Escobar did was put a tape player in my head and record thoughts and things that I've said and then put them in her book and gave me no credit. <laughs> No royalties whatsoever. <laughs> and it was, it was, guys, it was almost frightening reading through this. And, but it was so powerful, I bought a copy for Deb, and then I bought a copy for another friend. And I, I think I've given away about 12 copies of this book. We even went to Denver to meet her and after a church service, and she spent about an hour and a half with us. And it, it was really, really incredible. Um, and very different. Very, yeah, very different. Okay, so what do stages of faith look like? Stage one is a recognition that, holy cow, there's a God? Holy cow, get it? <laughs> holy cow? Oh, okay. Um, and then from this recognition of God, you move into stage two, which is a life of discipleship, where you're learning all the tenets of your faith and learning about God. And then this is usually followed by Stage three, the productive life, where you decide, I want to give back. I want to participate. I want to mentor. I want to sponsor. I want to help other people. And, and honestly, the majority of Christians live right here. Most, they can spend their entire life in stage three, serving and giving back. These people are like the pillars of the church. But then something happens that urges them to go a little deeper. And, and you start what's called stage four, the inward journey, where you're starting to, to kind of find God, not because the pastor said, or because your parents said, but because I want to know God. I'm hungry. There has to be more here. And that leads you then into stage five, which is once you've done this inward journey and, and the work has done its, God has done its work in you, then it becomes an outward journey of sharing and helping and loving, but not based on earning approval, but based on God's done good things for me, so I can do good things for you. And then the life of love, which is stage six. Now, interestingly enough, this, was, this book was recommended to us by... Um, a mental health therapist who, who used to go to our church. And um, <laughs> we were talking with her. She and her husband came to dinner one night. And we were talking and she goes, oh, you guys need to read this book. Because you're really, you're in stage four and you've hit the wall. And we're like, <laughs> Well, actually, there is a wall. But for some caveats, these stages are fairly fluid. We move back and forth a lot in the stages. You can experience more than one stage at a time. 
You can have a home stage. Like I said, a lot of people stay in stage three their whole lives. That's okay. That's okay. But there's an innate longing for more. God has hardwired us with an interest to grow, an interest to follow, to learn. We're hardwired for mystery. And you can also get stuck in a stage. So often what happens, we talked about the wall. What happens is somewhere in here in the inward journey, often the inward journey is, is, uh, is propagated by suffering or loss. Loss of a job, loss of a child, loss of a career, loss of a spouse, loss of a marriage. Something happens that makes you question all the easy answers in stage one through three. And you, you, you come up against that wall. And the mystery of meeting God's face to face, meeting God's will face to face, you lose a spouse or a parent dies or something happens and you, you just come face to face with that. And sometimes as a result of that suffering, you move forward into stage five, into, into that grace and love. And when we asked our, after we read it, we went back and talked to our therapist again, our therapist friend, and, and we asked her, do you know anyone in stage five? She goes, well, one or two people. Do you know anyone in stage six? I've never met a single person in stage six. <laughs> so it's like, well, crap. <laughs> I really wanted to kind of like skip the four, you know, and go on to. Yes. Okay, I have a problem with uh, the mystery of meeting God's will, basically. I think I have a problem with God's will. Yeah. Because I don't like the interpretation of tragedy happening as, as being as God's, will. God's will. I agree. This is probably not a good way to phrase it. More, maybe more we could say the mystery of meeting God while we're facing stuff. Yes, I, I can go with that. Yes. <laughs> I know why we call her sheep. We must be obeyed. <laughs> Think of it as you run into a life circumstance that your doctrine no longer fits. Yeah. Right. Where you what you've always thought is the way God would do things suddenly doesn't match your reality. Right. Your kid comes out gay in an anti-gay church, or um, someone you're near and dear to has had an abortion and you don't know what to do with that, that news or acknowledgement. Or maybe your mother dies and you're so tired of your friends asking, have you prayed the four spiritual laws? Like that'll just take care of everything with your mother. And all you want to do is be with her in the last stages of cancer. And you really don't care whether there's more spiritual laws at that moment. Right. And so rather than thinking of you're, you're meeting God's will face to face, the mystery is all your paradigms for faith and how you embrace them suddenly don't, don't work. work. And, and nobody around you understands that. And if you find God in that, you move forward to stage five. So now in these stages, um, there's the wall. Um, some people hit the wall and go back and start over. Some people hit the wall and say, well, my Baptist theology didn't work, so I'm going to go try Methodist theology. Or my Methodist theology didn't work, so I'm going to go try Lutheran theology or Catholic or Judaism or whatever. You just cycle back and you start this over again. Other people go through it into stage five and, may, and hopefully maybe on stage six. I guarantee you, I am not stage five. And if I ain't five, I ain't six either. So you can guess <laughs> where I am, okay? Um, Escobar talks about these first three things as being fusing your life. And then when you hit the wall, you either go back or you spiral down 
or you go through. So she, she identifies three options, whereas Hagberg and Wellich only identify two. But this unraveling, is what Escobar calls it, you hit the wall, nothing works anymore, and your faith unravels. So if we take the background off, you have fusing, and then you're either going to shift, or you return, or you unravel. I don't know if any of you have felt this or wondered this or the reason I share this is because we were Pentecostal hand waving tongue talking filled the Holy Spirit miracles growing legs all that stuff and we hit the wall and came through it and uh, but in the process, unravel a lot. In fact, I remember sitting, I was with my therapist and um, I, I said, I, I have this picture of me sitting in this big pile of rubble because everything I believed has come undone. It's all crumbled. And she said, hmm. How long did it take you to build that structure that those walls were all about? And I said, it's like 35 years. And she said, well, here's what I would do if I were you. Pick up a rock, examine it, and decide, you know what? I don't believe that anymore. And throw it away. Pick up another rock. Go, I'm not sure about this one. And put it down. Pick up another rock and go, you know, I still believe this. I still believe this. And she said, keep that and use it to build with. And so my deconstruction and unraveling probably turned a corner and I started to rebuild probably in 2018, 2019. Um, that's when I started writing my own creed and a lot of things like that to rebuild. Now, what happens with many people is they deconstruct and they unravel and they just quit and go away. Carol, uh, I think the very first forum I came to, you were talking about the duns. The duns, you know what a dun is. They've just had it with faith, they've had it with religion, they had it with institutions, they are just done and they walk away. But now I hope you know, rather than being angry at them, Realize what they went through to decide, I'm going to walk away from everything I knew. Because they're just done. I get that. And they might come back. They might come back. But the reason I get it was because I was hanging by my fingernails on the edge of done when we met in the EOC at Castle. Was it you? Sorry. <laughs> yes. and and he helped me come back and climb back and start this rebuilding structure so nuns and duns they need our love and our support and our compassion yes the, a key factor of how a nun and a nun might recover is either being in a church or a community of people who give them the freedom to doubt and not get freaked out about it. Right. In fact, embrace it. So when we met Dr. Scott, he was just like, cool, tell, you know, what's going on? <laughs> and he wasn't freaked out by it at all. We were in Utah and, and he knew, I mean, one of the key reasons why people, young people are leaving the Mormon faith is there is no room to doubt. Or question. Or question. You can't even have a healthy discussion about it. And so they have no choice but to leave their church or to stay. And usually they have to make that decision in a very abrupt way. Right. The other, there's another category of people here that we should also talk about. Uh, um, SBNR, spiritual but not religious. There are a lot of people out there who are deeply spiritual but they don't go to a church. I like those people. There's also a difference between 
people who leave the church as an institution. Right. It's a difference between people who leave the church as an institution because they're done with the institution. Right. But they might not be done with the belief. Right. So people are done for different reasons. I think that needs to be acknowledged. And and thought deeply about really, because does that mean that the institution of the church needs to be changed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we're in that that kind of hinge thing going on right now with the transition. This church can change. Kathy, you had a comment? I'm just wondering, so are you, um, you, you did the unraveling. You didn't go the none and done route, although you almost did. And so as you're picking the rocks that you're going to keep, does that throw you back into stage two or three? Or is there, uh, you say you're not in five and you're not in six. What? I guess I'm just wondering, or is there yeah, people who didn't say six ever also part of that uh, pillar of the church group? Or is um, that in something entirely different? I, I, I think um, they're, they're not, well, I, don't, I, I want to be careful how I say this. They're the kind of people who in a church, they're not deacons, they're not ushers, but when you're hurting, you know who to call. Those, those are the fives and sixes, especially sixes. They're just, and I might have met one or two now after all of this. You just don't consider yourself a four, or is the wall breaking down? Are you uh, I'm, I am reconstructing. Reconstructing? I'll say it that way. Reconstructing. Okay. Um, this is a great quote from Diana Butler Bass. People believe, but they believe differently than they once did. This gets to your point about spiritual but not religious. The theological ground is moving. The spiritual revolution is afoot, and there's a gap between that revolution and the institutions of religious faith. That gap looks like this between the two trapeze. And you got to realize if you've never had this experience, don't be too critical. Because <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes it's a fraction of a second. Sometimes it's three or four years. And waiting for somebody or someone or God or something to catch you and embrace you and, and pull you back. So east of hell, west of heaven, between the two trapezes. Um, summary thoughts. So we're in a rummage sale. We're in the middle of it. Some of us are gonna swirl in the center. Corporately, churches are unloading the doctrinal core. Individually, some people are shifting. And some metaphors might help us understand this. Um, events versus processes. When do we have to end? No. No. Okay. Some people have an event theology. I got saved. I got baptized, I got confirmed. And that looks like this. You're kind of in the center and everything's happening to you. The only problem with that is you start to get tired and eventually you need more events or bigger events or a bigger hit, it's like a drug. And sometimes you just live for the event. And that's a disappointing way to live. Other people view it this way, it, it's a process. You're moving by, by uh, um, event, but the event kicks off a process that moves you along. And then maybe there's another event and that kicks off a process that moves you along. Except it is rarely in life like that. It's usually more like this. <laughs> we wander around wondering, what the heck just happened to me? What is going on? But, but there is great consolation in the scripture because it says of Abraham, he moved by stages. It's, uh, it's uh, Genesis, I might look up a verse, proof text it. <laughs> Genesis 12, then uh, 12, 9, and uh, 13, 3. Then Abraham continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. 
And then from the Negev, they continue traveling by stages toward Bethlehem. They pitched the tents between Bethel and Ai, where they had camped before. Our father in the faith was not magically translated from Ur to Jerusalem. He walked the whole darn way. It was hot and it was dusty. And then even once he got there and God said, I'm going to give all of this to you. Now you're going to have to walk through it. And he went by stages. We grow and learn and travel by stages. Another potential metaphor is we, we have lived our lives on a map. And always on the map was that red arrow that says, you are here. And you kept traveling and kept working. And, and all of a sudden you get up and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm on the edge of the map. What the map failed to tell me was that there's a, there's a whole land out there. There's a world out there. Except it's undefined. <laughs> Here be dragons, you know. Yeah. And, 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 and you realize that you really only have a couple of options. One is to go back, skirt along the edge of the map, or just go, hey, Jesus, you're me. And you walk out there following the Spirit's lead into a wilderness which has no roads. And, and, and this is so scary because you don't know where you're going except you're following the Holy Spirit's lead off the map. So you're not alone. If you're going through this, you're not alone, you're not crazy. If you're not going through this, you're not alone and you're not crazy. Have the courage to differ and the grace to differ graciously. Because you may not agree with me. You may think I'm just full of <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Trust the path ahead. Anthony, uh, Anthony, Antonio Machado has this wonderful poem called Proverbs and, and Canticles. But in the end, he's, one of the lines in that is, is, we make the path by walking. Pilgrim, there is no path. We make the path by walking. Um, Deb talked about this at Theology on Tap a week or two ago about peregrinatio, the call to wander, uh, wander for the love of God. And there were Celtic monks who would take a, you know what a coracle is, the real round, round bottom boat. And um, they would get in the coracle and push off from land and not take a path. They were just going to wander for the sake of God. And wherever God took them by wind and current, that's where they went. Peregrinatio. Uh, Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon, said, sometimes we have to go apavia. Apavia means against the road or no road. The notion that it's roadlessness. And where you're going is just you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and some of your band of friends with you. And you're out following God off-road. Uh, and I want to stop here. I'll leave it with this. Your desire for more of God than you have right now, your longing for love, your need for deeper levels of spiritual uh, transformation that you have, that then you have experienced so far is the truest thing about you. It's not your sins, it's not your failures. It's not your mistakes. It's not your history. The truest thing about you is you're sitting here in this room today because you want more of God. That's the truest thing of you. That's the truest thing of you. You want more of God. Mm -hmm. So we're going to stop there. It's time's up. Yeah. Oh, we have it. A thing to discuss also, and that is that we have um, we're going to go to a ten o'clock service, but we have we have two uh, forums scheduled for uh, the first two Sundays of May of June. Of June sorry, um, and so the question is this: Would we want to meet at eight thirty, at nine, at twelve? 
Uh, I'm thinking 830 myself because I think nine pushes us a little bit too much. And uh, many of us are used to used to coming at 830 anyway. So, but what is your what is your plan about this? So eight thirty. So yeah. Yeah. So eight thirty. Form eight thirty and uh, ch uh, church of ten. And that gives us a little bit of uh, sometimes an hour is not enough. So that gives us a little less of time. Zoom folks, do you want to weigh in on any of this? <laughs> Two left. Uh, if they unmute, they can tell us their thought. Yeah, Zoom people, do you have any ideas? Are you there, Daryl? Daryl's gone. Oh, he's gone. 8.30? 8.30. All right, 8.30 it is. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Tom. I'm thinking of just 